Hello, my name is Stephen Thomas, and this video is called General Notes on Azure from a BizTalk developer point of view. And this is another video in my series related to Azure Integration Services and Hybrid Options. And what I really want to do here is spend just a few minutes going over some things that I've learned right away when I first started working with Azure that really helped me out kind of get accustomed to Azure, definitely from an on-premise BizTalk developer perspective. So let's dive in and take a look at some, some notes. First, I want to talk about being an Azure pricing architect, which if you're coming from a BizTalk background, is definitely not something we're accustomed to. Um, BizTalk server, you buy BizTalk and you pay a licensing fee and you get X amount of uh, services included in that. You get a workflow engine, you get a rules engine, you get a mapper and stuff like that. With Azure, you really have a a la carte model and picking and choosing what services you need and want to pay for. So. This is going to be really our job of the future. As we look at moving components into Azure, we're going to have to really understand the price impact of the technologies we choose. Uh, something else to keep in mind is that I've noticed pricing tends to change every now and then. Some things stay consistent for years and years, um, but some things like storage it's kind of and compute is kind of one of them that actually tends to go down over time, I guess as new, stronger compute um, VMs are released, the older ones are less relevant. Uh, there's some things that start off in preview, especially when you look in the Azure portal, you'll see a lot of things in preview. Um, generally things in preview are free. So keep in mind that they might not even have a pricing model uh, talked about yet. So when they move out of preview to make sure you understand what the price of those uh, features are gonna be. You can also look for developer priced options. So there's a uh, bigger services than Azure will have like a developer version. So like integration accounts, for example, have a developer edition that you can use at a discounted or free price. Not all developer I, uh, systems are, are cheap or free. So keep that in mind too. And do understand the limitations of, of your developer artifacts that you're working with. As I mentioned, not all developer systems are cheap. It used to be a, an integration environment that as a developer edition was still uh, hundreds of dollars uh, a month. <clears throat> Azure's features and services are going to vary a little bit by region, especially if you're working in some other cloud versions like the government cloud. Uh, services tend to release in a couple core regions first, and then they're spread across other regions in the U.S. and then other regions in the world. So if you're uh, a lot of things you'll look at, especially in preview mode, you'll see that it's it'll tell you what regions they're available in. So not everything's available everywhere. Just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and pricing can also vary by region. So if you're doing things in the U.S. versus things in Asia Pacific or Australia, the pricing is going to vary for your services based in those regions. Something else I like to talk about, again, not something that we really had to ever focus on as an on-premise BizTalk developer, is what I like to think of as just-in-time architecture. So what this really means is I'm going to design a solution as best I can with the artifacts that I have available today. That means I have logic gaps, I have service bus, I have API management, stuff like that. Some of those components like API management, we didn't have access to five years ago, at least not in Azure. So I'm going to architect my solution just in time using the components that we have available today. You want to decide with this if you want to use those preview features. There's a lot of new and exciting things in preview mode. They're generally safe. Um, I've had experiences long ago, seven, eight years ago, where some parameter names would change on some preview features. But we weren't uh, leveraging preview features in production. This was just in our test environment, so I was able to capture that. And we did move things into production as they came out of preview, though. Uh, support may vary if they're preview features, so you want to understand that impact. And some preview features never come out of preview or just quietly drift away. So um, I'm not sure what the guarantee level is around if they would ever go live or not. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, another thing I've noticed is I built some Logic App solutions six, seven years ago, still in production today, working just fine. Well, is there a time and place to relook? At, at those and rework those solutions using these new features. As I mentioned, APIM wasn't available then, um, but it's working just fine in production now. So there's probably no reason to spend money and time to go back and retrofit older solutions as long as they're meeting the business needs uh, uh, today. Uh, I would tend not to rework solutions. Otherwise, you would constantly be refactoring your work in Azure as new and new services came out. Um, obviously, if there's a business need for it, then, then you'd want to address it at that time. 
Uh, some more general notes on Azure itself. Um, the only thing I've noticed that's consistent is inconsistency. So and really what I mean here is things constantly are changing. New services being added, the designers are being updated, um, the look and feel of things are changing. So you will see a lot of things that will change over time, especially if you step away for uh, a month or two and come back, you will notice uh, a lot of things that, that were different. Naming standards matter just as much in Azure as they did in BizTalk Server. For whatever reason, the name that you get in some of these windows to see are so tiny, just like BizTalk Server. So having a defined naming standard is, is important. Um, here's a link to one that Microsoft has came out with. There's several others out there. The only wrong naming standard, in my opinion, is to not have one. So uh, come up with the naming standard and try to follow it through. That said, when I do demos in some of my other videos, I'm not very good at, at following a defined naming standard for my demos, so um, I should just embed that and, and try to do that better. Um, building your solution is only about half the battle. So really the key to Azure, much more so than when we had BizTalk Server on-prem, is the DevOps side of Azure. That will really allow you just to easily move things from your development environment to your QA, to your test environments, and then eventually into production. Um, it'll allow you to be able to rebuild all those components if, you, if there's a disaster, you need to change regions, change data centers. Um, having a well-defined DevOps process takes a lot of time, but is really the key to having a, a well-built Azure integration uh, solution for your enterprise. So don't overlook the DevOps side of things. And it's not easy, especially on the Logic App, if you've worked with binding files and BizTalk Server, I hate to say it's a similar story to binding files. Look and feel conceptually is very similar to binding files in BizTalk. But now you have essentially configuration for logic app service, bus connectors, all kinds of things that you have to keep track of. The story in DevOps is getting better every day. So it's a lot better than it was years ago. Um, but just keep in mind that there is going to be a substantial amount of uh, effort put into the DevOps side of things. I found having more than one Microsoft account tends to cause all kinds of issues all over the place. I work with a bunch of different clients, I have a bunch of different Microsoft accounts for many different clients and constantly have issues signing in and out and switching accounts to the point where I would come up with virtual machines that I only use for certain clients just to keep everything nice and clean working with uh, multiple Microsoft accounts. Uh, architecture in Azure is more than just the technical solutions, more than that technical piece, because now we have that pricing component to things. So you could have a beautifully architected solution using enterprise service bus and logic apps that pull every three seconds, and then you end up looking at the cost of that solution, and it could be thousands and thousands of dollars a month for something that might not need that kind of level of, of servicing. So want to make sure more than just architecture, keep that price in mind, which is going to be kind of a new thing for a lot of people to start thinking in the back of their minds there's a cost there. Not everything comes out of preview, so I want to make sure I mention this again to keep that in mind. Something else I've started to run into problems with, gosh, I guess 25 years ago, but there are these two, I think two brothers created this great site called hotmail.com. I set up my Hotmail account. I've used it ever since as my main email account. Microsoft bought them a few years after they opened, and now it's part of Microsoft. So just recently, past two, three years, I've been having a lot of issues when I'm using my Hotmail account with Microsoft services. Um, I'm sure you've all seen when you log in, uh, are you a work or school account or are you a personal account? Uh, a lot of things are not liking those personal accounts. BizTalk 2020 and connecting to Azure is one of them. It doesn't like using that Hotmail account for that. It does have to be a work or school account. So keep that in mind. I'm slowly transitioning away from my beloved Hotmail email, uh, but keep in mind if you're using that uh, you could run into some potential problems. Something else I want to mention here is serverless versus not serverless. So serverless is still there. It was this huge buzzword, what, about five, five, ten years ago. Everything was serverless. Functions were serverless. Logic apps serverless. Pay-per-use model was great for us developers. We could build all these beautiful services. If they never run, we never pay a cent for them. That's fantastic until the business gets involved and said, well, we need a more predictable model for what we're going to be charged for our interfaces that you guys are building. And we're saying, well, it's serverless, it's pay-per-use. That didn't always go over well. So 
definitely serverless is not as strong a buzzword as it was a few years ago because of businesses wanting to move to this fixed compute model. So serverless is still there. We'll see you in other videos. We still have serverless um, for functions in our logic apps that we can use. Things in Azure in general, though, tend to be moving away from kind of the serverless style into things that I guess I'd consider an app service environment, an ASE is what they call it. Um, and what these are, these are fixed units of compute. Think of it as a virtual machine. And these guys are scalable. They can't have isolated resources. I think all ASEs will have isolated resources. You can read a lot more about ASEs, find whole videos on them. They, they go through multiple versions as well. A lot of, you'll see this in Azure. Those ASE V1, 2, and 3, and there's probably higher than that now. Different ones have different features, do different things, stuff like that. But they're this fixed unit of compute. So instead of saying, I have a thousand logic apps, counting the number of actions and seeing how much that's going to cost me, I can just now pay you know $150 a month for my fixed unit of compute. Uh, what are some other helpful tools? These are things uh, I've, I find that I use quite frequently. There's this little site called httpstat.us where you could pass it in a code slash 200 and it'll echo you back a 200 response. I find this very useful in testing a lot of um, obscure paths. I want to know what happens when I get a 404, stuff like that. I find this useful. Logic Apps has implemented some static response templates kind of thing. So isn't as useful as it was you know, several years ago with something I still use. Uh, Postman is a great go-to tool for testing out logic apps and testing out our uh, API management components that we're exposing and stuff like that. So I recommend everyone take a look at Postman. A service Bus Explorer. Service Bus uh, has gotten more and more support with everything in the uh, portal itself, but I still, uh, old school Service Bus Explorer was this little tool you could download or runs locally. I still like Service Bus Explorer, even though it's getting, I think it's per verbatim now in the portal, but I still, I still like my desktop tool. Same with Storage Explorer. Uh, just another tool that runs on your desktop allows you to, to interact with your Azure storage accounts. Uh, so what are some, my last uh, my last thoughts about Azure and BizTalk? So what you see is unlike BizTalk Server, Azure is always changing. So constantly getting a refresh. BizTalk Server had a multi-year refresh cadence. Yeah, some feature packs came out here and there. But for the most part, um, Azure is changing very frequently on a monthly or multi-month basis. If you want to learn more, um, this is just part uh, one part in a larger video series. Go to stephenwthomas.com slash learn. I'll have links to all these videos in this series. There's also some content on Pluralsight that I put together, one on enterprise messaging and one on enterprise logic apps. There's two older ones uh, related to logic apps. Uh, the content is still very valid. You have to go to the my author link to get access to them, though. They've removed them from search because they are older, five, six years old, but the concepts are still the same in both the Getting Started and Fundamentals uh, course. So thank you.